matter is, the commandment has to be carried out sincerely and correctly. Sincerely meaning for the sake of Allah. Correctly Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The proof is the statement of Allah in Surah Al-Kahf, verse 110. فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا Allah Azza wa Jal, he mentioned, whoever hopes with the meeting or for the meeting with his Lord, then let him work righteous actions. And he doesn't associate anyone in the worship of his Lord. And this verse here, two matters, or rather three matters are mentioned. Number one, having hope for the meeting with one's Lord. The ulama, they say, the only one who hopes to meet Allah is the Muslim. So that's the condition of Islam. That a person has to be a Muslim in order for their actions to be accepted. Let him work righteous action. That's the condition of following the Prophet ﷺ. Because if a person is performing an action in which he is worshipping Allah with, but he's not following the Prophet ﷺ, the action is not considered to be righteous. Because he's worshipping Allah with something that Allah didn't legislate. So that act cannot be looked at as being a righteous act because it's not something that Allah legislated the people or legislated for the people to worship him. The third matter, وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا And let him not associate anyone in the worship of his Lord. That's the sincerity. So in this verse, verse 110, Surah Al-Kahf, you have three conditions being mentioned. Islam, ikhlas, and ittiba. Islam, being a Muslim, having the sincerity, and having the following of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah, he commanded, that the action be righteous, meaning in accordance to the legislation. And that when a person is performing the act, he intends by it the face of Allah Azza wa Jal. So this level here opposes two matters. A shirk wal bid'ah. Shirk and bid'ah causes the action to be rejected. And in reality, these two matters, sincerity and correctness, this is la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When a person testifies to la ilaha illallah, the person is saying that they're going to worship Allah alone. And when a person testifies to Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the person is saying that they're going to worship Allah the way the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam worshiped. That's from the meanings of the, the two testimonies that they make. But these testimonies are not just mere statements that we make. They are conditions connected to these testimonies of faith. There's meanings behind these two testimonies of faith.
there is an oration on the authority of Abu Umama al-Bahili that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stated in Allah la yaqbalu min al-amal illa ma kana khalisan wa bafuqiya bihi wajhu that indeed Allah does not accept the action except that which was done sincerely by which his face was sought and this narration is collected in the Sunan of an nasai and it was declared to be Hassan, a good narration by a Shaykh Al-Albani, Rahimahullah. Also we have the narration on the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu an, where he mentioned that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah said, And this is Al-Hadith Al-Qudsi. Ana aghna shurukai an shur. Faman amila amalan. Wa faman amila li amalan ashraka fihi ghayri. Fa ana minhu bari'un wa huwa lilladhi ashraka. Allah Azza wa Jal, he mentions, I'm the most independent of having partners associated with me. So whoever does an action for me, and he associates other than me with me in that action. I am free from him, and he is for the one that he associated with me as a partner. So the narration establishes that if a person commits shirk in the action, that Allah is going to abandon him. And Allah is free from the person, which is an indication the act is not accepted. And on top of that, the person will be entrusted to the individual or the thing he did the act for to get his reward. And no one will be able to reward or punish except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as Allah mentioned, Maliki of the deen, that Allah is the master of the day of judgment. No one is going to be able to give reward and punish. So the people who committed shirk in their actions, they will be told, go to those who you did the act of worship and get your reward. And there will be no reward. There will be no reward. Another narration, which is similar, Ana agra shurakai ana shirk, man amila amala ashraka ma'i fihi ghayri taraktuhu wa shirk. That I am the most independent of having partners associated with me. Whoever does an action in which he associates other than me with me in that action, I abandon him in his act of shirk. So Allah Azza wa Jal clearly states that he will abandon the person and the person's action. But there's no reward for that. Likewise, we have the narration of Aisha radiallahu anha. Man amila amalan laysa alayhi amruna fahuarad. Whoever does an action that does not have our affair over it, it is rejected. So now that's for bid'ah. So the first narrations were for shirk, and now that narration is for bid'ah. So in both cases we see that the action is being rejected, is not accepted. So when a slave is carrying out the act of worship, it's a must that the act be done sincerely and correctly. If it's not done sincerely and cor correctly, it's going to be rejected. In relation to this level, people are divided into four categories. The first category of people 
those who perform their action sincerely and correctly. When they go about to worship Allah, they do it sincerely and they do it correctly. That's the first group. Second category, those who do the act sincerely but it's not done correctly. So these are the people when they perform an act of worship, they have good intention. They're not doing it to show off. They're, they're truly seeking to worship Allah. But they did not follow the way of the Prophet The third category of people, they are the ones, their actions are done correctly but they're not done sincerely. So the person, as an example, he gave sadaqah. The person, as an example, he's reciting the Quran correctly, but his intentions are not pure. He gave sadaqah in front of the people so that the people can say he's generous. He was reciting so that people can hear his voice and say, MashaAllah, he has a good recitation. So the act itself is an act of worship that has been legislated, but the intent of the individual is not sound. The fourth and last category of people, they are the ones, their actions are not done sincerely, nor are they done correctly. An example of this, those individuals who have entered into Islam to destroy Islam from within. Firstly, they pretend to be Muslim. So they come into the fold of Islam, we accept them. But the reality is that they are munafiqun. They really don't believe in Islam. And their intent for entering into Islam is to destroy it from within. So now what do they do? Once they are amongst the ranks of the Muslim, they begin to introduce new ideologies and creeds to corrupt the creed of the Muslim and to lead them astray. And an example of this is Abdullah ibn Saba. Abdullah ibn Saba. He was a Jew from Yemen. And he entered into Islam to corrupt Islam from within. His action was not sincerely, nor was it correct. He is the one who encouraged the people to revolt against Uthman and eventually they killed him. He was the one going around to different places inciting the people. But under what banner? Under the banner of commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. Also, he was the one who during the Khilafah of Ali ibn Abi Talib, he said that Ali was Allah. And the people, they followed him. And they begin to say that Ali ibn Abi Talib was Allah Azza wa Jal. So Ali ibn Abi Talib, he dug a ditch, set it ablaze, and he punished those people. And it is mentioned that even with that, the people went further into their deviance by saying that indeed he is truly Allah for no one punishes with the fire except for Allah. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he had wrote a letter to Ali ibn Abi Talib mentioning to him that it was not befitting to punish them by burning them to death because that's how Allah punishes them. And had it been him, he just would have had applied capital punishment to him. And then he mentioned the narration of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and whoever changes his religion, then give him capital punishment. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, he was looking to apprehend Abdullah ibn Sabah, but he fled. And then you had those at that time they didn't go that far to say that Ali was Allah, but they said that he was better than Abu Bakr or Omar. So Ali, radiallahu anhu, he lashed those individuals with 80 lashes. 
180 lashes. Why did he lash them with 80 lashes? 80. But why 80 lashes? What is 80 lashes the punishment for? Not falling. Fornication is fornication is 100 lashes, and banishment to the land for a year, and adultery is being stoned to death. But what kind of lie is that? Slander. So when they said that Ali was better than Abu Bakr or Umar, that was slander. Because he knew that he was not better than Abu Bakr or Umar, so he lashed them with the lashing for the slander. And that's where the Shiite come from, that movement of Ali being Allah or Ali is better than Abu Bakr. They, they came from Abdullah ibn Sabah. Well, that came from the Rafi, the extremists from amongst them who have hatred for Jibreel alayhi salam. They say that Jibreel, he betrayed the trust that was given to him. But not all of them say that. But you have from amongst them those who do believe. So in any event, The action has to be done sincerely and correctly. And out of the four groups, they are the only group whose actions are accepted. Those who fulfill both conditions, the condition of sincerity and the condition of following of the Prophet. If a person has sincerity but he's not following the Prophet, the action is rejected. If a person is following the Prophet but he doesn't have sincerity, the action is rejected. And if the person has none of the two conditions, the action is rejected. So many from amongst the people, as the Sheikh had mentioned, those who do the action, that the action does not take place in a manner that is sincere, and if it does take place in a manner that is sincere, it doesn't take place in a manner that is correct. So this goes to show that there are different categories of people when it comes to performing the acts of Ibadah. Ibadah is Tawqifiyah. Ibadah is Tawqifiyah. The origin regarding Ibadah is al manna any prohibition. You can't do anything until you know that that's an act of worship that Allah legislates. Once you know that it's an act of ibadah, now what's upon you is to be sincere and perform. So before you do anything, you must know that this is what Allah has commanded you. We are not allowed to just worship Allah with anything. Knowledge precedes statement. قال المؤلف رحمه الله تعالى المرتبة السادسة أن الصالحين يخافون من حبوط العمل بقوله تعالى أن تحبط أعمالكم وأنتم لا تشعرون وهذا من أقل الأشياء في زماننا The sixth level The righteous people They are afraid of their actions being rendered null and void. This is based upon the statement of Allah the Most High and that your actions be rendered null and void while you do not proceed. The Sheikh, says, this is from the least amount of things in this day and time of ours. The righteous people at the head of them the prophets and the messengers. They are afraid that their actions will be rendered null and void. No one should have a feeling of comfort or surety that his acts of worship are going to be accepted by Allah. You don't know. 
we can make the prayer, and we really don't know for sure that Allah accepted our prayer. Perhaps we were negligent in making wudu and didn't even realize. Perhaps there was negligence in the prayer. Our, our minds drifted and wandered and start thinking about something else. So now the shaitani stole something from the reward of our prayer. Perhaps. Perhaps when we were fasting, we said something that we shouldn't have said and didn't really pay no attention to it, but it affected the reward of the fast. We don't know. So you find the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to make dua, he said, Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafi'an wa rizqan tayyiban wa amalan mutaqabbalan. Oh Allah, indeed I ask you for beneficial knowledge. It's the first thing the Prophet asked for, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because the knowledge precedes everything. And I ask you for good provisions. And I ask you for actions that are accepted. That's a real important point that the Prophet is saying here. I ask you for actions that are accepted. So even he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is asking Allah to accept his action. Not having this feeling of guarantee that the actions are going to be accepted. For Allah, he mentions, Indeed, Allah only accepts from those who have taqwa. Do we have taqwa all the time in all of our faith? So perhaps due to the lack of taqwa, Allah doesn't accept an act of worship. Or we don't get the full reward for an act of ibadah. So the righteous, they are afraid of this affair. As you find some of the Sahaba, they said, if I knew for a fact that one prostration of mine was accepted, then I will be guaranteed the power. But look how the fear was there. Not even being sure that one prostration was accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of the, uh, one of the tabi'in, he said he met about 30 companions. And all of them afraid of hypocrisy. Umar ibn Khattab was already promised paradise. He still went to Hudayfa ibn Yaman and said, I know you know the secret of the Messenger of Allah, meaning the names of some of the hypocrites. I don't want to know who they are. I just want to know, did he mention me? This is the fear. But none of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum ajma'een, although they were praised in the Quran and praised by the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, being described as being the best of the people, the best of the nations, brought out from mankind, with all of these praises and characteristics of righteousness that they have been described with, they were afraid that Allah will not accept their actions, or that their actions will be rendered null and void. It's mentioned that after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would make Salah, after the Tasneem, what would he do? Ayyuan, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. You know the benefit of this? Salah say, Yerhamukallah, the Prophet did this as a means of seeking forgiveness for any shortcoming that may have taken place in his prayer. This is the Prophet The best to pray amongst them. Still he, after the prayer is over, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. And we know the position of the Prophet Sallallahu regarding the prayer was the coolness of his eyes. He would say, Ya Bilal, arihna bis salah. Oh, we allow, bring us ease and comfort with the prayer. We, some of us, we can't wait to get out of the prayer, looking for the ease and comfort out the prayer. Imam start reciting. Recite. Long story. Don't you hurry up. The game is on. You know, you're thinking this to yourself while the Imam is reciting. Don't let it be the playoffs or the championship. SubhanAllah, be humble. Yes, we ain't here, so oh, Allah, our heart, man. You know, these are the thoughts going through your mind. You ready to go? You want to get out of the prayer? It's fine, Allah, be humble. Some of us, we do this, we know. But the Prophet was different. His his delight and his comfort was in the salah. 
as it is described from his sunnah, that whenever something would trouble him, he would go and pray to Raqqa. Because that was his ease, that was his relief. Some of us, we look for relief in other things, other than that which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sought relief in. But even with him having this feeling about the Salah and loving the Salah, he still said, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. Perhaps there was a shortcoming in the prayer. Now, when a person performs an act of ibadah, a person must be careful not to fall short in the ibadah. And he must take account of himself in relation to his ibadah. In taking account of oneself before the action, while you're doing the action, and then after the action. Taking, play, taking account of yourself before the, before the action, meaning that your intentions are sincere. And even while you're performing the action, that you're maintaining the sincerity and that you're doing it correctly. And then after the action, you take account of yourself by not doing something that will nullify the action. The scholars, they mention some matters in relation to taking account of oneself. Number one, al ikhlas fil amal. To have sincerity when doing the action. And that the action is something for Allah while you're performing this action. And you're not changing up your intentions. Also, you're following the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in that action. Another matter that you testify or you worship, or you perform the action in the manner of ihsan. Even though you can't see Allah, but you know Allah is watching you perform this action. So you do the best you can to make the action to the level of perfection. Also, acknowledge that you performing the action is a favor from Allah. Because we can't do any act of ibadah except that Allah gives us the, the success to do it. And that's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Us coming to the masjid and praying in the masjid, Allah favored you to do it. A person he fasted in Ramadan, Allah he favored that person. A person he pays his zakat, Allah favored him. Because how many people are not praying? How many people? For the Muslims. They're not praying as they should. They're not paying their zakat. They're not fasting as they should Ramadan. They have not made Hajj, although they have the ability to do it. And other than that. And also, a person, although he strives for perfection, he should always keep in mind that he may have fallen short. So he seeks Allah's forgiveness. So we take account of ourselves. In every action that we do, every statement that we make, before you make a statement, think, is this going to get me closer to Allah? Is this statement the right statement to make? Or is this something that I shouldn't really be saying? You have to, you have to take account of yourself. Don't just be a person, everything that comes to mind and heart, you just say, blurt it out. Perhaps one day you say something that you will really regret, or that will cause some harm. To yourself or to others or both. So a person must be mindful. You have to take account of yourself before the action, during the action, after the action. Allah 
Allah would tell he revealed his statement in Surah Al-Hujurat. Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu, la tarfa'u aswatakum fawka sawt al-Nabi. Wa la tajahru lahu bi qawlika jahri ba'dikum bi qawlika. An tahbata a'amalukum wa antum la ta'adu. Wa la tashuru. All you who believe, do not raise your voice over the voice of the Prophet. As you speak to one another. Lest your deeds be rendered null and void, and you do not perceive. When this verse came down, or there was a companion by the name of Thabit ibn Qais. He was missing from the gathering of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet said, where is Thabit? So one companion said, he's my neighbor. Let me go find out what happened. So he went to the house of Thabit and found Thabit in the house very sad. And he asked them, what happened? What's wrong? He said, I'm going to hell. So why do you say that? He said, because Allah sent down the verse, don't raise your voice above the voice of the prophet. And it's known that I've raised my voice above his voice. So Allah, he renders my deed null and void, and I'm going to the hell. So the sahabi, he went back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, Oh Messenger of Allah, I found them. And then he mentioned what Thabit said. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, He is not from the people of the hellfire. Bal innahum min ahl jannah. Rather he is from the people of paradise. But the point from the, from the incident is look how when the verse came down, he reflected over himself. Unlike us, we hear a verse, we say, yeah, so-and-so be doing it. Quick, right? <laughs> hey, man, man. That was a powerful chuppah. Yeah, your man was talking about so-and-so. We don't look at ourselves first. In the way of the Sahaba, you look at yourself first. Before you will go to apply the hadith or the ayah to someone, look at yourself. Is that applicable to you? Are you the one who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about, you have those characteristics that are not praiseworthy. In other words, we have to look at ourselves and not look to blame or put, or put the verse or apply it to others. You know how the Salaf they were, as one of the Salaf Qubail ibn Iyad, he said, when I disobeyed my Lord, I seen the ill effects of that in my wife and in my children and in my writing." He didn't blame nobody else. Sisters always causing fitness in somebody's marriage. He looked at himself. That when he, because of his disobedience, his wife is not being cooperative with him. And his riding beast and his children. Al-Jazam and Jensen Amal, the reward you receive is based upon the type of actions that you do. If you don't obey, obey Allah, and you are supposed to obey Allah, and you turn against the obedience of Allah and become disobedient, Allah turns someone against you who's supposed to be obedient to you. Like your wife, like your child, like your riding beast. So the point of the shahid is that a person must constantly look at himself. As Allah mentions, وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ Whatever befalls you from a calamity is from your own hand. We quick to put the blame on someone else of why something wrong happened. That's not the way of the Salaf. They look at themselves. What did I do wrong? Where did I fall short? Let me re- Why? So that he can rectify himself and fix the matter. And better his relationship with Allah so that his worldly affairs can be straightened out. There's a narration on the authority of Aisha radiallahu anha. She said, Ya Rasulullah, call Allah Azza wa Jal, Walladina yutuna ma atau wa kurubuhum wajila, huwa alladhi yasrib wa yazni wa yashrabu al-khamar, huwa yaqafu Allah. 
Aisha radiallahu anha, she is with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one day. She said, O Messenger of Allah, and that's an example of, although she was the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the most beloved to him, she still addressed him with that title of honor. O Messenger of Allah. Because of the respect for that which Allah has given him of that status. She said, Allah, he said, and those who give that which they give while their hearts are trembling with fear. She's saying, is this talking about the one who steals, the one who commits zina, the one who drinks khamr, and at the same time he fears Allah? Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, La ya binta Siddiq. He said, No, O daughter of Siddiq. La ya binta Abi Bakr. No, O daughter of Abi Bakr. Walakinahu alladhi yusalli wa yasum wa yatasaddaku wa huwa yakhafullah. Rather, the verse is talking about the one who prays, fasts, and gives sadaqah, but at the same time, he fears Allah. Another narration says, لا يا بنت الصديق ولكنهم الذين يصلون ويصومون ويتصدقون وهم يخافون ويخافون ألا يقبل منهم. He says, No, O daughter of a Siddiq. However, they are the ones who pray, they fast, they give sadaqah, and at the same time they are in fear that their actions will not be accepted. That verse is Surah Al-Mu'minun. Verse number 60. وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْتُونَ مَا آتَوْ وَقُلُوبُهُمْ وَجِلَةٌ أَنَّهُمْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ رَاجِعُونَ And those who give that which they give and their hearts are trembling with fear that they have to return back to their Lord. So Aisha understood that the verse is talking about criminal Muslims. Those who steal, commit zina, consume intoxicants. But at the same time, they're fearful that they're going to have to go back to their Lord and answer for these crimes. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he corrected her. Because there's a principle. لا يجوز تأخير البيان عن وقت الحاجة لا يجوز تأخير البيان عن وقت الحاجة It is not permissible to delay Clarifying a matter at the time of need. So she misunderstood the verse. So now the Prophet, he has to correct her on the spot. Because she has a misunderstanding of what Allah has said. He cannot let that slide. Or say, be patient with the people. No, you have to correct them. And of course, we correct in the best of manners. In the best way, starting with gentleness and being lenient. Because that's the origin when dealing with Muslims. That you deal with them in a gentle manner and be kind with them. Especially when you see that someone is making a mistake and it's not intentional. Aisha radiallahu anha, she's not intentionally misunderstanding the verse. That's what she thought the verse meant. But the Prophet, he said, No, O daughter of Siddiq. And this is him honoring her by calling her the daughter of Abu Bakr radiallahu anha. He said, But it's talking about the person who prays. The person who fasts, the person who gives sadaqah. But at the same time, they still are praying. That goes back to what the Sheikh mentioned, that the way of the righteous is that they are afraid that their actions will not be accepted. So here, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned this. The last point connected to this level, then we move on to the last level and then we'll be finished with the book. Be aware of being a person who lives a double life. When you're in front of the Muslims, you have the image of piety, of, of piety and righteousness. But when you are alone, you are intentionally a criminal. There's a narration on the authority of Thoban. This is in the Sunan of Ibn Majah. عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال لأعلمن أقواما من أمتي يأتون يوم القيامة بحسنات كأمثال جبال تهابة بيضاء The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said Indeed, I know a people from my nation 
They come on the day of judgment with good deeds similar to the white mountains of Tihama. Meaning the, the, there's a lot of deeds because these are big mountains. But Allah will make those deeds like scattered particles of dust. But can you imagine the Prophet is saying this to Thoban? Muslim, people from this ummah coming, good deeds the size of mountains. But then Allah will turn these deeds into scattered particles of dust. So Thoban, he says, Ya Rasulullah, sif hum lana, wa halli him lana, wa fi riwaya jalli him lana. O Messenger of Allah, describe them to us and clarify who they are. Because Thoban, he doesn't want to be from them. Again, showing the methodology of the Sahaba. When they ask these type of questions, it was for the protection and for the examination of themselves to see, do I have these characteristics? So he says, describe them to us, O Messenger of Allah. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, أَمَّا إِنَّهُمْ إِخْوَانُكُمْ وَمِنْ جَلْدَتِكُمْ He said, as for them, they are your brothers, and they are from you. يَأْخُذُونَ مِنَ الْلَيَلْ كَمَا تَأْخُذُونَ They take from the night, like you take from the night. وَلَكِنَّهُمْ أَقْوَامٌ إِذَا خَلَوْا بِمَحَارِمِ اللَّهِ انْتَهَكُوهَا However, there are people that when they go into private with the prohibitions of Allah, they violate it. They violate it. This hadith should put fear in the hearts of all of us. Especially when we are in the confines of our home and no one is around from amongst mankind. Some have this feeling that I can ease up now. And do what I do. But you have to be careful. Allah may render your deeds not in void because you live in a double life. You have all these good deeds, as is mentioned, at the mountains of Tihama, but then when you're in the privacy of your homes or whatever, with the muharram, with the, with the, with the prohibited, prohibited matters, you violate it. Some of the ulama, they held that this hadith is related to the munafiqun. Because it mentions that their deeds will be made to be scattered particles of dust. And this does not happen except with the person who is a disbelief. As Allah mentions, And we have gone to that which they have done of action, and we have made their action scatter particles of dust. So the scholars, some of the ulama, they held this narration is talking about munafiqun, who pretended to be Muslims doing good deeds in public, but then when alone, they violated the prohibitions of Allah. Other scholars say, no, this is speaking about Muslims. That this is referring to Muslims. And this is the punishment for the people who like live double lives. Not for just a Muslim, okay, he got weak. And he fell into sin at night. No, but the one who actually is intentionally living a double life. He has one face in front of the Muslims in the daytime. At night, intentionally, he's a drug dealer. At night, intentionally, he's a murderer. He's a stick-up kid. He's a fornicator. He's an adult. Intentionally, this is what he does. Not talking about somebody striving to be righteous and they just happen to fall short during the nighttime. No, he's talking about somebody... This is their intent. They, they are like this intentionally. One must be wary. The last level mentioned by the author, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Al Murtabatu Sabi'ah, Al Thabatu Al Al Haqi, Wal Khawfu Min Su Il Khatima. We call he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Inna Minkum. من يعمل بعمل أهل الجنة ويختم له بعمل أهل النار وهذه أيضا من أعظم ما يخاف منه الصالحون وهي قليل في زماننا 
التفقد في حال الذي تعرف من الناس في هذا وغيره يدلك على شيء كثير تجهله والله أعلم The author he ends by stating رحمه الله تعالى The seventh level is to remain established upon the truth meaning the commandment of Allah you have to remain consistent and established upon that and you have to fear having an evil ending meaning dying in the state of dis, uh, disbelief or disobedience or innovation based upon the statement of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that indeed from amongst you you have those who do actions of the people of the paradise but then his life ends while he's doing the actions of the people of the hellfire. May Allah protect us. It's, it's, it's a scary affair. That a person for a long time in his life, worshipping Allah, praying, fasting, the Hajj, Umrahs, and then right before he died, he changes. He changes. It's possible that the person was a munafiq. Then his affair got exposed at the end. Or it's possible the person was truly a Muslim, but then because of some deviance within himself, Allah didn't give him the guidance to die upon that which is coming. It can happen to anyone. No one is safe. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to make dua. وأعوذ بك أن تتخضطني الشيطان عند الموت Oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from the shaitan The word actually means a kidnapping أن يتخضطني He's saying I seek refuge with you, O oh Allah, from the shaitan snatching me away from the deen at the time of death This is the Prophet now making this dua How much more so for us We definitely need to make this dua because we don't know, the shaitan doesn't leave you Okay, you're sick, stage four uh, cancer, or it's over for you, and you're going out. They can say, okay, he, he, that one got away. He's still on you. Look what Allah did to you. All of the years of worshiping, Allah afflict you with this sickness. What, what did you do? Why Allah making you die this time? This is shaitan that comes at you. The scholars, they mention this type of thing. To get you to have doubts, or to have, be displeased with the color of Allah, so that you die in that state. Shaitan, it doesn't leave you. It is mentioned that when Imam Ahmed was upon his deathbed, the people was trying to get him to say shahada, and he was saying, no, no, not yet, no. Pass out, wake up. So when the people said, he was trying to get you to say shahada, and he was saying, no. He said, the shaitan came to me, told me that, you know, I beat him, I defeated him. And I was saying, no, no, not yet. Life, you don't win until you die as a, as a believer. But until the, the, the angel of death take that soul out, the shaitan is right there harassing you. So the sheikh, he mentions this as the last level. The level of being established firmly upon the truth and being fearful of dying in a bad state. Being established upon the truth is al-istiqama. Holding to that truth, not deviating, swinging to the right or the left, remaining on that straight path. From that which aids a person to remain firmly on the path, constantly reciting and pondering over the Quran, making dua, having good companionship, Reading the biography, the biography of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and the Sahaba. Trusting that Allah Azza wa Jal will aid you. Having fear of dying in a state of disobedience. One must be careful. And know that whatever you grow up upon by the permission of Allah, you die upon or you grow old upon. And I mention this as the scholars, they say that you find some people throughout their lives, they enter music. 
is big for them more than the Quran. And then at the time of death, you try to get them to say La ilaha illallah, as the Prophet mentioned, Man kana akhiru kalamihi la ilaha illallah, dakhala jannah. And it's difficult for the person to say La ilaha illallah, rather he'll start singing songs. Why? Because that's what he grew up on and lived his life upon. So Allah allowed him to die. They say, Man aasha ala shay, nata alayhi. Whoever lives upon something, he dies upon it. For man mata ala shay, hu'itha alayhi. And whoever dies upon the thing, he's resurrected upon it. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned, إِنَّ مَنْ عَبْدِ يُبْعَثُوا عَلَى مَا مَاتَ عَلَيْهِ The Hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullah is in Sahih Muslim, that indeed the slave is resurrected upon what he died on. And then you have the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّ مَنْ أَعْمَالَ بِالْخَوَاتِينَ Actions are, are based upon how they end. Actions are based upon how they end. And an example that's given, a person, he's praying Salat al-Isha. And while he's praying Salat al-Isha, MashaAllah, he recites with a beautiful recitation, in the first raka'ah and the second raka'ah. He has khushur. I mean, this is the best prayer he's ever made. But then right before he tasneems, he passes God. What happens to all of that? Gone. Doesn't even count. Doesn't matter. You know you you know you pass gas, the salat is broken. The prophet mentioned don't leave the salat till you hear something or smell something because that the question is said, he be imagining that something has happened. So the prophet told him those two things. Don't leave the salat until you hear a sound or you find a smell, meaning don't leave until you're sure you pass gas. Don't go off of uh, what you think is happening. That he's imagining that he passed gas. But the Prophet mentioned, Don't leave the prayer until you hear a sound or you find a smell. Meaning, for certain you have passed gas. But sometimes you pass gas and there's no sound and there's no smell. But you know you pass gas. So when you know you pass gas, the wudu is broken. But don't think that that narration means that if you pass gas and there's no sound or smell that you can remain in the salah. Well, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned that uh, as a figure of speech to show that you're certain that you have passed gas. And that's one of the, these are one of the, uh, from the ways that a person is certain he passed gas, that he smells something. Sometimes you pass gas, you don't hear nothing, but you smell something. This is the silent bedellies, right? <laughs> you know what we say? Yes. <laughs> you know, man, the silent bedellies, all right? Follow you, you know, come on, Ikhwan. We know how it is. Laying in the bed with your spouse and all that something. Somebody let one know. You don't hear nothing, but it's just, you know, the fumes. You're like, Astaghfirullah, come on. You couldn't get up and go to the bathroom. I mean, it's, it happens. You know, so you know. So is that, does it have to be both? It could be one of them, or it's none of them, meaning you don't hear anything, you don't smell anything, but you know, you felt it, you, you know, you passed gas. But the point of the shahid is that, look how beautiful that salah it was. But he didn't complete it. And he nullified it. So it doesn't count for nothing. A person's life can be like that. You can go through action life doing beautiful things, pleasing to Allah, but then at the end you break, you destroy everything. So one must be careful. As the narration it mentions, in the rajul la yamal al zaman al tawil bi amali ahl jannah, thumma yuhtamu lahu amaluhu bi amali ahl al nar. Wa in the rajul la yamal al zaman al tawil bi amali ahl al nar, thumma yuhtamu lahu. That indeed you find that a person he's doing good deeds for a long period of time. A zaman, a tawil. He's doing the actions of the people of paradise and then he ends 
his actions by doing the actions of the people of the hellfire. His life, it, it ends that way. Or a person, he can be doing the actions of the people of the hellfire for a long period of time. And then his life is ended by doing the actions of the people of the palace. It can go either way. Look at the man who was a mushrik for his life. Came to the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and said, Oh, messenger of Allah, should I participate in battle with you? Then take shahada, or take shahada, then participate in the battle. Participate in the battle. Take shahada, then participate in the battle. He took his shahada, went into the battle, and he died. He died. And, and it was said the man didn't even pray. He didn't even pray a prayer yet. He didn't even fast a Ramadan yet. Right then and then Shahada into the battle, killed. You don't know how life is going to end for you. The person should be mindful. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to make dua, Ya Muqallib al Qulub, Tabbid Qalbi ala Dini, O Turner of the Hearts, establish my heart upon your religion. So one must definitely turn to Allah and ask Allah for the stability. As Allah mentioned, Worship your Lord until certainty comes to you. This is a command to worship Allah until death. Not like the Sufis think, the extremists from amongst them, that certainty here is when you reach a certain level of knowledge that you don't want to have to pray and fast. No, worship your Lord until death comes to you. If Allah as the mentions, illa wa antum muslimu, and do not die unless you are Muslim. Now the question is, how can somebody implement this verse when the person doesn't know he's going to die? The scholars they say that this verse means that you have to live every day of your life and every moment of your life as a Muslim. So that when the angel of death comes to you, you are in the state of Islam. You're in the state of being a Muslim. Because you don't know when it's going to come. Death may come upon you all of a sudden. So if a person is always practicing Islam, he is implementing the verse, not dying, except that he is a Muslim. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we see that he was a person who was afraid of the punishment of Allah. That when he would see clouds, he would get worried. Because there are times that Allah sent clouds to town and the people thought rain was coming, but then a punishment came. This is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How much more so? We want to rectify our lives and our affairs and make Tawbah before the time comes when there is no Tawbah. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَقْبَلُ تَوْبَةَ الْأَعْمَالَ الْيُعَرَهِرَ That indeed Allah, He accepts the tawbah of the servant as long as He has not started that marvel of death, meaning when the soul is coming. So the door of tawbah is maftuh. As the Prophet mentioned, دَعْبُ التَّوْبَ مَفْتُوح حَتَّ تَطْلُعَ الشَّمْسِ مِنْ مَغْرِبِهَا That the door of tawbah is open until the sun rises from the west. Whoever's alive at that time, when they see the sun rising from the west, they're going to go to make Toba, but Allah will not accept it at that time. Because that's a major sign of your mercy. And the people will believe once they see that. It's not going to be. So it's a must that we rectify our situations before the time comes where we cannot rectify it anymore. And be consistent upon worshipping Allah, Barakallah Fikum, this is the best thing that we can do. Take it one day at a time. One day at a time. Make sure let's get our five prayers in. Let's make sure we're making dhikr, the tasbih. SubhanAllah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah. Let's make sure we're being kind to our families and good to our wives and children. Make sure we're being good to... We're doing this on a daily basis. Take it one day at a time. Because so, one of those days is going to be the day that it's time to leave this place. Which one? Allah Allahu But at least we were in a state of doing good. So that Allah raises us up upon the good. Look how when the Sahabi was making Hajj with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was in a state of Ihram. He was saying, Labaik Allahumma Labaik. Labaik la sharika laka Labaik. Inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal muk la sharika la. He fell off his riding beast, broke his neck. Died. 
We yes. wanted to shout, or the Prophet said, leave him in that because on Yom Qiyamah, he's going to be raised up in his ihram, making the talbiyah. Allah. So that's how he died. So the way you die is the way you're resurrected. So we want to die upon goodness so that we're resurrected upon goodness. And that's the end of the treaties. And we thank Allah Azza wa Jal for allowing us to complete this book. And whatever is correct, the praise is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And whatever is incorrect, it is from myself. Wa subhanaka Allahumma bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha ila anta astaghfiruka wa ta'ala. Jazakumullah.